you all for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Yuri Leskovich. Yuri is a tenured associate professor at Stanford University. He is the chief scientist at Pinterest. He had a company that he sold to Pinterest, and that's how you become chief scientist. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he's also an investigator at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, doing cool <coughs> stuff on drug design and discovery, as I Obviously understand it. Stuff. Yeah, and those are examples of it. So, um, Yuri is from Ljubljana, he got his bachelor's there, he went to Carnegie Mellon, worked with Christos Voluzos, got his PhD there, and then uh, did a postdoc with John Kleinberg at Cornell. Um, if you have any projections into uh, machine learning, data mining, network science, or computational social science, you have probably read one of, or more of his papers, he's won the Lagrange Prize, many other prizes. Um, and so thank you so much for coming and being here. All right, thank you. Uh, great, so thank you for having me. Thank you uh, for coming. Sorry we start a bit late. Um, so this talk um, will be about uh, our recent work in our group, maybe in the last year, year and a half, um, thinking about how, how, could you, how, do you, how could you apply or extend the traditional deep learning toolbox that's been uh, basically successful on uh, vision and speech and think about how do we do that for networks and what does it mean and so on. So what I'll do is, uh, my talk has three parts. First I'll tell you um, something about uh, the machine learning parts, and then if, if there is time, time I'll tell you something about evolution of networks, some other work that I'm super excited about. Okay, so um, here is how we'll think. we'll think. We'll think as computer scientists and we'll think as machine learners. So what is you know what are examples of machine learning tasks on networks? Maybe you are given a partially labeled network, meaning you know some, some nodes are yellow, others are, are violet. And the question is, can you guess the colors of the, of the gray nodes? Right? So what we would like to do is, we'd like to take this network as an input, build some model that will color um, the rest of the network for us. And if you think about how, do, how would you do that, you would want to go and somehow describe the structural position of these nodes in the network, and then based on their structural positions, You'd like to learn a rule that says, oh, you know, nodes are probably, I don't know, yellow if they have degree one, and all other nodes should be violet. For example, that would be the, learn that, uh, the rule you could learn from this data, right? But you don't know this rule ahead of time, so what you spend is a lot of time trying to figure out how do I describe the positions of nodes in this network so that then I can do something <coughs> on top of it. So when we do kind of machine learning to networks, it's always a good question, how do, how do I bring in structural information to my, to, my, um, to my model? And the way we would usually do this is, I take my network data, then I would think very hard and try to use domain knowledge and intuition to come up with some set of node feature descriptors that tell me about stru structural positions of these nodes in the network, and then I would go apply my favorite algorithm to produce a model and make some predictions. And where would I generally spend the most time? I would spend the most time here trying to come up with these structural descriptors, features, uh, whatever you want to uh, call them. And I would have to do this every single time for every different task, every different domain I, I would want to do something, right? So the question then becomes, how could I go and somehow not even need to worry about feature engineering? Could I just directly learn on networks uh, and forget about everything else? And this is kind of what is the, the promise of deep learning and success of deep learning is to find these representations, basically features, in, in data, uh, in, in large data. And this has been especially successful in computer vision where humans were not able to come up with good feature descriptors for an image or in speech where again it's very hard to hand engineer those descriptors. So what we would like to do in some sense, at least intuitively, we'd like to take the network on the left and we'd like to pass it through some deep neural network to make some predictions here on the right. And these predictions can be something about the nodes, could be something about the links of the network, could be about the subgraphs, could be about entire graphs. So we don't really, in some sense, care or we are agnostic about what the prediction task will be here. Um, one important thing to notice is that as these networks propagate the information forward, what you usually do is at some point in time you can, at one of the last layers, you can look at the network and you can look at what, what parts of this network activate. And, you can, and, and what you generally find is that this gives you a very good description or um, a representation of a given node in the network. So you, you can train up all the way up to the final prediction task 
But then you can make a layer or two um, back, back step into the network and say, okay, what is the description of the node that I learned um, uh, in this network? So one important thing is that this brings us to this notion of embeddings, where basically you can take the nodes of the network and the, learn, the network learns how to embed these nodes into some low dimensional space, right? Some RD where D is a couple of hundred in practice. And in some sense, once you have this descriptor, you can do you can do whatever you want with this, let's say, node descriptors or node embeddings. You can you can you can compare them, you can make predictions, you can cluster them, and so on. And just to give you one example how this idea of node embeddings work, if I take the most famous network of them all, right, and um, and I compute um, and I would want to compute the node embedding, then here is a two-dimensional node embedding of that network where you know the colors correspond and kind of spatial positions make sense. These nodes are all embedded here. You know, the red ones are here, right? The green ones are these guys and they are here and you know, 25 and 26 are here and so on. So you see how this kind of respects the structure of that, right? So what would I like to do is, the goal in some sense will be to map each node in a low dimensional space where I wanna basically in some sense learn this representation of nodes in a, in a supervised way, I want to somehow the, the positions in this embedding space to somehow indicate, let's say, link strength or network structure similarity. Um, and uh, this will then allow me kind of to encode the network information and generate this node representation. And the hope is, right, if I take my network, maybe represent it as an adjacency matrix, I come up with these latent embeddings of nodes. For every node, I come up with a set of coordinates. I can then use this for all kinds of different tasks. So how my um, talk will be structured is, I'll first tell you about how to get to these embeddings, and I'll then give you examples of a couple of tasks that are interesting. And you can think of you know, doing anomaly detection, community detection, link prediction, clustering, graph classification, graph similarity matching, or um, a lot of things can be done in this embedding space. So that's kind of what we would like to do. The question is, why is this hard? The reason why this is hard is because traditional deep learning toolbox has been designed for simple data types. Essentially, we know how to deal with grids and we know how to deal with, uh, with, um, uh, with long chain graphs, right? So if you think of images, images are just fixed size grids, right? In when, you, when, you, when you apply deep learning models to vision, it's always images of exactly <coughs> the same size, so you can think of them as these nice grids the, the spatial locality is well defined, so it can do things over there. If you think, for example, of text and speech, they also have a very natural structure, which is a linear structure. So you can kind of think of having sliding windows over this, um, over this um, let's call it a line graph, right? So again, it's clear what's the notion of locality. But if you think of real world graphs at complex networks, these things are, these, these things are quite different, right? First, they have arbitrary size, and they have kind of complex topological structure. And they have no kind of spatial locality like grids have, right? So if we know how to deal with these types of objects, it's not clear how to deal with uh, that size of object. And if you think about it, there is uh, one important difference is that in, in graphs, graphs are kind of invariant to, to node ordering, right? So I can reorder or renumber the nodes in the network, but the network is still the same. While if I take the, the, the image and I permute rows and columns of that image, that image is no longer the same, right? So that's one, one thing that is important. So in some sense, we have no reference point in graphs. And then many times, right, these graphs can be dynamic, can have multimodal features, and so on. So this is what I wanted to say uh, for the introduction. So what I want to do next is show you our approach how do we take, let's say, intuitions from this area, but apply them to, uh, to complex networks uh, in a good way? Um, and the method we developed um, in our group, we call a graph sage, and in some sense, generalizes neural networks to graphs. So um, here's my abstract setup, and then later I'll tell you about applications and how does this work in practice, right? So my setup is I'm given a graph. It has a set of vertices. Um, let's assume this graph is undirected, so I have a nice symmetric adjacency matrix, and then every node in the network is described by a, some set of features, right? So this would be um, some kind of meaningful node features. In social networks, this could be user profile information, user's picture, and so on. In, um, in uh, biological networks, this could be gene expression profiles, and so on and so forth, right? So every node in the, 
in the network as a set of neighbors plus has some basic uh, feature characteristic uh, of itself. And then one way how you could now start thinking about applying neural networks to this is the following, right? Idea would be, I take my little graph, I have my adjacency matrix, every node in the network has some, some features, some properties, and then I could take every line of this network as, a, as an input to a big deep neural network and pass it through and make some predictions about that node uh, in the end. And if you think about this idea, maybe it sounds good for the first half a second, but it's kind of a terrible idea, right? Like, wh why, why this won't work? The first thing it won't work is, I can, I can take this graph, renumber the nodes, or reorder the nodes in some different way, my adjacency matrix will differ, and then this network will be totally confused. That's one option. Another issue is that if I now take a graph on, um, on six nodes, this network doesn't know how to handle graphs on six nodes. It only knows how to handle graphs on five nodes, uh, where each node has two features. And then another thing is, if you think about how many parameters do I have, I have more parameters than I have data, right? Because my input, even the input is, the size of the input is, is proportional to, the, to the, size of, the size of the data, size of the network. So basically I have the number of parameters that's linear in the size of the data and I'll never be able to train them. So um, this won't work, but you know, what's, what, where could we go? Right? We could go and start thinking about how does about the success of convolutional neural networks applied to images. And if you think what a convolutional neural network is, essentially you take your, your image and you define this convolutional operator that you are kind of sliding across this image. Right? It's just kind of a sliding window. Right? And then you, know, you have multiple of these convolutional operators stack one on top of the other. So the question is, how would we go and generalize this notion of, of convolutional operator um, from these grid graphs to real networks, right? So what I'd like to have in some sense is, I'd like to have almost like some notion of a sliding window that I'm kind of sliding across the graph, and, and then based on, based on whatever I see, I'm able to make some uh, predictions or uh, recommendations. And of course, um, doing something like this doesn't seem won't necessarily work, but at least you know the intuition is right. And the way you can you can you can do this on graphs is to have the following idea. The idea that's kind of crucial is to say, oh, let the node network neighborhood define the computation graph for me, right? So the idea is that the social network structure, if you want to think of it that way, is essentially my computation graph. So what this means is that if I want to compute something for node i. I will look at its neighbors and neighbors of neighbors to define the computation graph. And now this computation graph is the structure of my neural network. And then what I will do is I will, I will learn parameters of how to borrow information from neighbors of neighbors, how to propagate that information, aggregate it here at the blue nodes, and then propagate it a step further to come up with some prediction for node i. Right? So the idea will be, can we learn, can, we, can the machine learning algorithm learn how to propagate information across the graph to compute something about the node? And, and this will work better than if you just compute something about the node from what you know about the node itself, because you're also learning how to borrow information from neighbors and neighbors of neighbors, okay? And that's, that's essentially the basic idea. So now let's go and kind of unpack what do we mean, what do we mean by this? Right, so the first thing that, that is important is that essentially each node will define a computation graph. Right, so if I have my network here and I want to make some prediction or, or find an embedding of node A, here is the neural network that will do that for node A. Right, and if you say how, how does this map, node A has neighbors B, C, and D, so here they are, B, C, and D. Right, and node D has one neighbor, node A. Right, like from here back there. So, you know, this is now a two-layer neural network that says how the information from the neighbors of neighbors of A gets, gets ag transformed, aggregated, combined with whatever the information the neighbors have, and then again, uh, propagated again, aggregated to, to arrive to know that. Okay? So, um, this is the first important point. It's basically every node will have its own different neural network. Um, now, of course, these boxes are some kind of learned parameterized operations that will take the information and learn how to aggregate it, okay? So this will be their own little fixed neural networks that learn how to aggregate and transform information coming from the, uh, coming from the bottom. 
And then another, another thing that is important is that, um, of course, we can make these networks to be kind of as deep as possible. Generally, we do, we do two layers, but you could do more if you would like. And um, one last thing I'd like to mention is that, is to drive home this point that every node defines a computation graph, right? So if for node A, the computation graph is here, for example, for the blue node D, this is its computation graph, and it's very different, because D has only one neighbor A, and A has three other neighbors, B, C, and D, right? So it's a very skinny graph, while the computation graph for node, node C is here, and it's much more, um, uh, has a much larger family. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, so, 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 like you said, each node has, uh, has one uh, neural network? Yes. Uh, so, like, you have N node, you have N networks? Exactly. Ways? Um, I, I, right now, I have N nodes and I have N networks. Okay. <laughs> Great. I, I'll come to that, of course. Okay? okay? Great. So, um, this is what I have so far, right? And as I mentioned, this model essentially could be arbitrary length. The way, the way or arbitrary depth, right? Like I can do multiple hops in the network. And another thing is, how do I initialize the inputs to this neural network? These are my base features at every node, right? This would be the, the profile, the user profile information or the image of the user in the social network. And I learn how to aggregate these images and propagate them uh, to this target uh, node. Now, how does this look like? Um, in practice, here is uh, here's the map. But basically what I do is the following, right? I have two types of operations. I have the transformation operation that takes the feature vector and transforms it, and then I have some kind of aggregation operation that has to be uh, order invariant, right? That takes the information from the lower level and um, transforms it and then aggregates it, right? So the way, we, the, way I, the way we do this is then when the information arrives here, I, I combine it with whatever is the feature vector of node B, and again transform that and pass it forward, right? So this way, um, these superscripts tell me the level, right? So this would be level one. This is level two. Here is here are the here are the here's the recursive equation. But basically, I'm saying if I wanna compute the feature representation for node A at level k plus one. What do I do? I go over the neighbors of this node A at level K, so one level lower. I take that information, I transform it, this is a matrix, and send it through a nonlinearity, and then I aggregate this. Maybe I sum it up, I can take an average, I can do a max pooling, whatever you like, so it's some general aggregation information. Then what I also do is I take node A's own information at the previous level, transform that, concatenate these two pieces, send them through the nonlinearity, and I get a next level description for, for node A, right? So the important thing is that I always take the information from the neighbors and combine it with what, whatever is the information at that node to compute the next level information for that node, okay? And of course, what we have to do as, as, as modelers, we have to learn these transformation matrices, W and Q, and we have to pick what kind of aggregator function are we going to use. And then, right, if this is what I've done, now how do I, how do I train this model? Basically, I just do back propagation, right? If I have some loss function, some, some way to measure the, the performance, the accuracy of my model here, I can take derivative with respect to this loss function, and I can propagate back the gradients to figure out what the parameters W and Q um, should be. And this loss function can be anything, could be some kind of classification on, or a regression loss, could be a pairwise loss, so something like link prediction loss, and then I just use basically stochastic gradient descent to back propagate the gradients. Now, what I said so far sounds interesting, but there is one, one huge problem, which is the question that was asked, how do you learn this if every network, if every node has its own network and every network has its own set of parameters? What you do is you assume parameter sharing. What does this mean is that we will assume that for all these different networks, these boxes are shared, right? So across all the nodes, I'm assuming that the aggregation and transformation operations at, at level two are shared, and aggregation and transformation operations mm -hmm. at level one are shared as well, right? So these W and Q matrices, they are shared across the nodes uh, of the network. Yes? But these networks have different structures, so yes. do they have the same parameters? I, the what assumption the is that, the assumption is that even though these networks have the different structures, they have the same parameters. Because all I all I learn is 
how to transform individual feature vectors, and how to add them together, how to aggregate. And, and this aggregator can be something simple, can be a sum, can be an average. You could even learn an LSTM if you want to say that there is some, something super important about these things. Uh, of course, what is also, what I mentioned here is, the way I define it, I say, take all the neighbors. In reality, you don't take all the neighbors. So you can actually decide how are you going to construct this, this computation graph. And that makes, in practice, quite a bit of difference. All right? Good. So um, why, why, is this, why is this good? This is good because um, the model is relatively small, right? All you have to do is learn the structure of those matrices that, have, that, that basically uh, are small. And the other thing is you can apply this model across the graph to the regions of the graph you haven't yet seen, right? So the idea is maybe I have this snapshot of the graph, I generate my training neural networks, I train, I train parameters uh, of my model on them, then um, you know a new a new node a new node appears, and I want to make a prediction for it. It's actually easy to do because all I have to do is for this node I generate the computation graph, I transfer the parameters over, I do the forward pass, and I make a prediction. So essentially, what this means is I can make predictions for nodes or for the parts of the network that I have never seen before. And another thing I can do, I can also transfer this across graphs, right? I could train my model on this graph and then deploy it on some other graph, right? Because all I care is basically to learn how to propagate and aggregate information in the network so I can apply this to networks I have never, uh, never seen before. And that becomes um, very useful. So what did I uh, want to, to tell you? I want to talk about this idea about how do we learn to transform these are these boxes and aggregate the information across the network where basically the the underlying complex network defines the computation graph for us um, this is extremely flexible because you have the, you can use different aggreg aggregators different ways to combine the information from your neighbors you can use different loss functions in a sense of a let's say an unsupervised loss which would be some kind of link prediction loss but you can also have a downstream task for which you can optimize uh, the structure, um, the parameters of this network. So we can really do kind of end-to-end -end learning. Um, the model has a constant number of parameters. It's amazingly scalable. Um, and it can be applied to any node in the network or even across networks. Um, may I ask the same question again? Uh, how do you guarantee that the same matrix is actually Oh, no, no, great. So the question is, how do we guarantee that these networks, huh? Because you were talking about handling a larger branch. Yeah, but it's no problem, right? These matrices, their size basically says, what is the, the size of your, what's the dimensionality of your embedding? So this, the size of the matrix is arbitrary, right? It will be like 256 by 256, right? So there's nothing, nothing here that depends on particularly the structure of this network. What depends is, what, what nodes are you aggregating over, right? And the size of these guys is small because it basically it says, what's the description of the node? And now you want to transform that description, right? So this is a 256 by 256 matrix, or, you know, 1,000 by 1,000. Uh, and second question, when you put A as a neighbor of its own neighbor, you create a recurrence structure. How does this handle the recurrence neighbor? I don't see the problem, right? Like here, the description of the of the node A is its base features, right? Here, um, here, what what will happen here is uh, what I'm combining here with is the the aggregation from the neighbors plus the B's own features. If I will, um, you know, what I'm doing here, I'm taking the representation of the of the node one level lower, um, which is different than what I put in here. It's not a recurrence. It's not a Exactly. All right. So I'm kind of aggregating from the previous level, and the nodes information at every level is different. All right. Yeah, um, yes. How important is the nonlinearity? So what happens if you don't use linearity? You have a linear transformation between those nodes, and you're back into the frameworks of uh, generalization of page rank because you have an aggregator that says like the average of the neighbors. So the basic con concept of the page. Um, the only difference is well, how important is it? Let's say you remove all this nonlinearity, all of this. And, can it still get the same expressiveness? Is it more powerful? Is it uh, this, this is more powerful. 
Um, we just have a paper coming out at iClear where basically we show that the, 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 this, this is as powerful as WL uh, graph isomorphism kernel. Right, so, um, and then the, how you can also uh, um, uh, uh, control the power of your networks is uh, depending on the aggregation function you use. And, and we show in that paper that some aggregator is the most expressive thing you can do. All right, so there's an iClear paper titled How Powerful Are Graph Neural Networks that goes much more into the theory. Yes? Just, uh, just briefly returning to this point, how, how are the W and Q matrices of fixed size when the number of neighbors uh, can be variable throughout the graph? Somehow I didn't understand that, I'm sorry. How, how can you have the same size W when you have uh, different... Yeah, sh uh, I mean, I can ask you back, where does the size depend on the number of neighbors here? Right, just look at this, right? Like, I have some fixed vector and I apply it with a matrix. This doesn't depend on the number of neighbors A has. And if you look at here, the iteration, the for loop over the neighbors is here. So this yeah. is just, but you take a neighbor and multiply it here. And then you add these things up. So I'm just adding these vectors together, right? Dimensionality doesn't, in doesn't increase, <coughs> right? I'm just, you know, if this is 256, I, I multiply with the matrix, I, I know again get 256, and I'm adding 256 dimensional vectors together, so this gives me another 256 dimensional vector. So there's sum before being input. Exactly, right, so the sum is here, and transformations are inside the, the nonlinearity. All right? All right, great. Uh, super, thank you for the questions, this was great. So I wanna show you two applications um, of this. Uh, one will be large scale. Uh, this is actually what's running in production at Pinterest. So a lot of this was motivated by trying to do recommender systems on a graph. So let me explain you how, how this works, right? So Pinterest is this human curated collection of objects. What does this mean? Every pin on Pinterest is basically a bookmark to a website. And it's a bookmark plus the image, right? And that target web page has some description, there is an image, and then there is the link to the target page. And what people do on Pinterest is they create collections called boards where they take these bookmarks and curate them together to things that belong together, right? So if somebody is in the market for a blue jacket, they will create, you know, uh, their board of blue jackets I like, and they will go and save these blue jackets to the board. And if somebody is in the market for a new chair, they will say, you know, the, the, the furniture I like, and they will save that chair into their own board, right? Their own collection. Um, and of course, now the way you can think of this, you can think of this as a giant bipartite graph of objects, pins being manually classified into collections. The graph has about three billion of these guys, so three billion pins, about two billion boards, and about 200 billion connections, right? So these objects have been classified manually 200 billion times into different collections. And what we would like to do, we'd like to use these ideas of graph convolution and neural networks to generate embeddings of nodes um, on, this, on this giant graph. And the key idea is that I wanna borrow information from nearby nodes. And the reason why I wanna do this is because I wanna, because kind of by only looking at the pin, it's very easy to make silly mistakes. It's very easy to confuse uh, a gate like this with a, with, a, with a rail like that. Right, so you know, a metal rail on the bed looks very much like a like a like a fence in a in a park. And there is many other examples where basically computer vision confuses things that look alike but are like couldn't be more different. But if you bring in the graph information, you know, these type of fences will never will uh, will be saved into very different collections than than you know metal uh, beds with ni nice rails. Right. So what this means is that you can use the graph information to enrich what you know about each, each individual P. And I'll, I'll give you examples how, how well this works, but here is how we'll think about this. What we wanna do is we wanna do recommendation of what pins are similar to a, to a given pin, right? So I'll say, here's my source pin, then you know this is a similar pin, so this would be a successful recommendation, but if for this source pin I recommend you this uh, you know, great Patagonia sweater, it would be a bad recommendation. Um, so what is the task? The task is to learn coordinates, the embedding of every of these nodes, such that the distance, let's say the cosine or Euclidean distance in this embedding space, between you know, cake one and cake two, 
is smaller than the distance uh, between uh, cake one and the sweater. Okay, that's my that's my objective function. As I mentioned before, we'll we'll do this on a graph that is not the full Pinterest graph, but but cleaned up version of it that has three billion nodes and about twenty billion connections, and every of these nodes, right, has rich image, uh, text, features, and so on. And we will basically apply the graph convolutional neural networks, where we'll say, in order to compute the embedding for this node in the graph, we will take its own features but also features from the neighbors learn how to aggregate them to compute something about that node. And uh, as I mentioned, this is the task we really, we really care about, is learning distances or learning that objects that are related are closer together than objects that are not related. And uh, one interesting aspect here is that the task is actually amazingly hard. And the reason why it's hard is because you are comparing one object against three billion other objects, right? And all we care about is that the, the, the correct related object is among, among the top 100 out of the 3 billion, right? So if you think, of, in some sense, at what the resolution do we have to learn this? I need to learn at the resolution of kind of 100 versus 3 billion, right? So this means that um, I have to recognize the correct object uh, in, in a set of 30 million objects, right? So um, why am I saying this? Because from user interaction, it's we can identify positive examples. I say if the person is looking at this type of car, then you know this is a this is a positive example. It's another car. This one says thousand uh, thousand thanks, and this one says thank you very much. You are special to me, right? So these two cards are very related. Now, of course, we don't see negative examples. So what you can do is you can pick um, random other pins and say this is not related, right? So this you know cottage is not related to the to the pin. Um, but the point is, if this is the data from which you learn, you will never be able to learn these distances at such fine scale resolution. So what we do is we come up with this notion of hard negative examples, which in this case would be a card, visually very similar, but it's very different. This is a happy birthday card, while these are, you know, a thousand times thank you card, right? And by, by using this kind of hard negative examples, we force the model to really learn this fine-grained similarities and differences um, uh, between the pins. And uh, we have a paper at, at KDD this year that describes this and goes into much more details about how this is done. And uh, it makes a huge difference, right? That you basically force the model to start making these fine-grained differences rather than, you know, recognizing how to distinguish a house from, from some piece of paper, right? Um, and, that, and that really works and, and allows you to do that. So let me just give, show you how well, how well this works. So what we are doing is we are doing what is called related pin recommendations. When you say a user is looking at a given pin and I want to predict what, other, what is the next pin they are going to interact with or save out of the set of three billion. Okay, that's what I want to do. And uh, how am I going to do this? Is I'm going to use this query pin and I'm going to say what other pins are similar to it, right? And I can do this in the visual similarity space, in the computer vision similarity space. I can do this in the textual similarity space. I can do this purely in the graph, uh, in the graph uh, based sense, using random walks to kind of measure proximity. Or I can, I can use the con graph convolutional neural networks, here I call this PinSage, that, allow, that learns how to aggregate the feature information, these two types of information across the graph to come up with the coordinates of the nodes, right? And the idea is that I want to embed the three billion pins, and then I want to perform nearest neighbor um, nearest neighbor query between the, the query and all other pins, and you know see how high up did I rank the true pin that the user is really uh, going to interact with next. Yes, yeah. Scorper, pin is like a collection? Pin is an image mm -hmm. plus text, right? And pins belong to collections, and that defines you the bipartite graph. Okay, um, and of course, every user comes, they can create their own collection and save some pins into it, right? So here is how well this works, right? So the, the setup is, I want to rank the, the positive example, the next pin against, you know, three billion other pins. And the question is, how well do I do this? Um, here is how well our approach does it. This is how well computer vision by itself will do it. And here's how well text will do it. This is now in the mean reciprocal rank. If we are looking at our recall, I think at 500, we are at 0.85 uh, recall, 
right? So basically, in 85% of the time, we are able to put this correct pin among the top 500, right? Basically, which is which is quite good. <laughs> and to show you to show you some examples, here is the query pin, right? I know some California loggers just cutting down a big tree, right? If you do visual similarity, you don't have enough resolution, so you get this kind of nice uh, historic images, you know, but it's some farmers, this is, I guess, First World War, things like that, right? If you do textual matching, if you say, what's the description of this image, and I want to match it to the descriptions of other images, then you get the topic right, right? It's something about logging and trees, but, but you totally miss uh, the style. And um, if you do the graph-based thing, it's not much better, but if you combine both the graph information plus the visual information through this graph neural network, you actually get really good recommendations, right? Kind of historic, historic pictures of uh, people cutting down trees, right? So one example. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is something about gardening. Visual essentially confuses uh, soil with uh, brown rice, so you get kind of some bibimbaps and things like that. Um, the, 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 the other two kind of give you something about plants, but not really related, right? While, while in our case, it's actually about growing little plants in little containers and so on. So again, we get very good recommendations. So that's um, what I wanted to show as first use case of this technology. And then the second use case of this technology um, I want to show is in, in different domain. It's what we are working with our collaborators at uh, uh, Chen Zuckerberg Biohub. And I'll just mention one paper, which is about predicting drug side effects, okay? So uh, what we want to do, we want to model what is called polypharmacy side effects, right? So basically, patients take multi multiple drugs, and there are complex interactions between these drugs that lead to all kinds of adverse side effects. Uh, and if you look at people, let's say people between 70 and, not, uh, and 80, uh, half of them uh, uh, eat at most uh, at least five drugs. Um, and you have many patients that are, you know, taking 20, 30 different drugs. You know, they have these little containers and, you know, whatever is in there, they would take, right? So um, what you want to do, just as an example of this type of task, is given a pair of drugs, can I predict what adverse side effects are going to occur, right? For any pair of drugs, I want to be able to make that prediction. And the way we'll do this, we'll do this using networks. So what are we going to do is, First, we are going to create this type of two-layer multimodal network, where uh, here is what is in this network. At the bottom, we will have physical protein-protein interactions. Okay, so this is a protein-protein interaction network around 20,000 nodes and 700,000 edges. Um, then we will have, in the, in the second layer, we will have drugs. These are triangles, compounds, right? Um, and uh, we have about um, 5,000 uh, different drugs, I think, where are all the drugs that are approved by FDA. And then what is also happening is FDA has a, a national adverse event reporting system. So whenever, whenever adverse side effect occurs, doctors would report it, and FDA has a way to then collect those measured significance and then say, yes, these two drugs really cause that side effect. So the way we'll do this is that we'll say that we'll create a link between the two different drugs if they cause a side effect. And each links will be of different types because there can be different side effects. And we have around 1,000 different side effects, right? So it means I have the protein interaction network. Each, each drug, uh, the way the drugs work is basically they target proteins. So I have the drug protein target information. So it means that this drug targets or changes the behavior of these proteins. Drugs interact with each other through side effects. And side effects are of different types. You know, this would say that C, C, drug C and M, when taken together, they lead to side effects R1 and R2, okay? So now what is, what is our task? Our task is, given the partially observed graph, predict the labeled edges between the drug nodes, right? So my side effect prediction will say, you know, is a given pair of drugs, does it interact or is it linked by a given uh, type of a side effect? So I need to predict whether there is a side effect and what type of side effect it is. How are we going to do this? We are going to use our graph neural networks, and the way we'll do this is we'll take the graph and learn the embedding for every node in the graph, right? So for triangles and proteins, I will learn some embedding vector. This is what we call an encoder, 
and then we'll use a decoder where basically, given two embeddings, I will want to predict the, whether there is a link between the two drugs and what is the type of the link. Okay? How are we going to do this? So, consider this drug C of interest, and let's say that this is its neighborhood in the network. <coughs> the graph neural network I'll compose looks like this. First, I will have a different aggregation mechanism for every different uh, type of uh, side effect, right? So this will be for R1, I'm taking the information from N and, and transforming and propagating it. Then I'll have for R2, a different neural network module, right? The side effect R2, C interacts with DNS. So here are DNS and I learn how to propagate. Again, I have those W and Q matrices here. Um, and then of course, I also learn how to propagate information from the proteins, right? So here, this drug C uh, connects to four proteins, so there's a different module that learns how to take protein information and propagate. And then again, I aggregate it, pass it through a non-linearity to come up with some descript description for uh, the node C, right? And uh, this is my embedding, what I try to learn. And so of course, sir, do you, yes. so do you, because in this example, of course, you the link has just one type, right? So, but do you mean that you have a different uh, aggregation procedure for each possible combination of types? No, just for each type independently. So if there would be R1 here as well, then, then this node V would be here and it would be here. Okay. Okay, but you could make this more fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, so this is for one node. As I mentioned before, now you get these things, uh, let's see if, my, if it works. For different nodes, you will have different networks. Um, again, and these are these modules that I was explaining to you before, right? And some, some drug might be uh, uh, cause three different side effects, so it has three of these drug uh, aggregation modules, and some other drug may only cause two side effects, so it has two of them. But each drug targets proteins, so each network has the, has the protein part. Okay? So that's on the encoder side. How about the decoder side? The way the decoder says works is, Given the two neural networks for two drugs, their descriptions, I want to predict the links. And the way we do this is that we, we basically learn 1,000 different predictors for each relationship type, right? So I'm saying, if you want to predict between uh, the, the link between CNS, you want to ask, do, do CNS uh, interact with side effect R1 all the way to side effect 966? Um, and here's the way we, we basically do this. You take the feature description of S, you take the feature description of, of, um, of C, uh, you have this um, relation specific matrices D and, and one kind of transformation matrix R that is shared uh, across all the, all the predictors. Okay? That's essentially the model. And now, given labeled data, you can basically back propagate this information all the way from here, all the way to there, to learn all the parameters, to learn the embedding to uh, learn the model. And I just show you how well this works. This gives us um, about 36% average improvement in, um, uh, this is um, uh, average precision at uh, 50 uh, over other uh, baseline methods. Uh, things like tensor factorization or, um, or uh, kind of unsupervised graph embedding <coughs> methods. Um, and just one example I'll show you is, um, here is what we also did is we asked our model uh, make predictions over all pairs of drugs and tell and let's take the 10 most certain predictions of our model. So our model would say, you know, these two drugs are going to interact with this type of uh, side effect. And none of this is in our data, right? So we took our data and asked the model, just make predictions and we'll take the top 10 most certain ones. And what we did then is to say, let's start with this, but then let's go back to medical literature and see whether some of these have been confirmed uh, recently, right? They are not in our data, can we predict them, and then independently some scientists confirm them. And for uh, five out of these 10, there is very recent papers, you know, a year, two years ago, when, uh, when these things were discovered, right? Now, you know, what, uh, what about the, the other ones? For the other ones, they can either be false or haven't yet been confirmed, so you can think of them as good hypotheses for what kind of side effects uh, might occur. So, what did I what did I want to kind of tell you at high level, right? Like, basically, I wanted to show you a way how can you apply kind of end-to-end -end machine learning to graphs, both to to simple graphs 
or this kind of heterogeneous uh, uh, multimodal, multi-layer networks. Um, and uh, how can you basically enrich the predictive power of the model by learning how to aggregate and share the information across the network. And you can do this for all kinds of different tasks. You can do this for, for example, node prediction, which is for like node labeling. You can do this on pairs of nodes for uh, predicting uh, uh, pairs, um, predicting links, what we did with drug side effects. And you could even do this at the level of subgraphs or entire graphs if you want to do graph classification or anything like that. What we do at the level of subgraphs, if we have a, a, a piece of work currently working where we, where we are trying to predict what um, what will be the therapeutic uses of a drug. So basically, what diseases a drug will will uh, will is going to uh, treat. And the way you think of this is to say, you know, a, a drug has a certain subnet, defines a certain subnetwork, and then you want to classify uh, that subnet. So what I'm going to do is um, let me summarize, right? So basically, what what was my talk about? It was about graph convolutional neural networks and how you basically can take these convolutions from that are defined over, over matrices and kind of generalize them to, to arbitrary graphs. And what this does, it basically it learns to fuse node information with the graph, with the graph information, and this gives a state of the art accuracy in classification, link prediction, graph classification, and so on. Um, what is nice is that the model size is independent of the of the network size or the data size, and we can really scale this, um, and it runs in production and uh, um, at Pinterest, so making you know hundreds of thousands of recommendations a second. So this really this really works, and it's um, and it's robust, right? Um, and it works really well. So uh, you know what did we learn? Let's say in the last two three years in this area. So what we learned is that this representation learning paradigm can be extended to graphs and that we can learn these representations in a, in a, supervi in a supervised way in an end-to-end -end, uh, fashion. This means that kind of no network feature engineering is necessary and that we are able to effectively combine node data with the network information. Um, and as I mentioned, leads to state-of-the-art results in a number of tasks. And one important thing is that this end-to-end -end training, rather than having these multi-stage approaches, really, really leads to um, better performance. Um, now, I can finish, or I can give you one more topic. I think you should finish on this topic. Can you talk about the topic in two minutes? Can you, minutes? <laughs> <laughs> can you give me four? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'll tell you about something very different, not deep learning but something I'm quite excited about. Um, so this is a PNAS paper that's coming up. Uh, but basically the question is, how, do, how does biological evolution change the structure of networks? Okay, so, you know, uh, you know Darwin said, uh -huh, you know, if, if you find something that, will, that doesn't kind of uh, uh, form by numerous successive small modifications, you know, his theory would absolutely grow down. Um, I don't know, uh, 200, 150 years later, we, we, we haven't, found, uh, haven't found that yet, right? So what we wanted to do is to say, could we understand how biological networks, like protein-protein interaction networks, how do, they, how do they evolve? How does biological evolution change or affect the structure of these networks? Um, and this is something we really don't know. We, don't, we really don't know how it happens, right? So here is what we did. We took the tree of life and uh, we looked at at protein-protein interaction networks of different organisms. Uh, so we have around uh, 2,000 organisms. Um, and in total, we have around um, uh, 1.5 million proteins with almost like 9 million edges. Um, and this is about 300 times bigger than what anyone has studied before. And the way we represent this is that you can think here, you have the tree of life, uh, right? These are the species. And for every, for every species, there is, a, there, is a, there is a network. And then what we do is we start looking at resilience of these networks, right? Because if you think of resilience, the idea is the following, right? If you have a biological network and some proteins mutate and uh, the network starts getting disconnected, this means that basically that the, that the proteins are no, no longer able to work with each other, so uh, the cell might die. 
Okay? And uh, <coughs> because Tina gave me little, very little time, we have a very nice way to, to define what is the resilience profile of the network. I'll, basically, we look at the, the uh, um, Shannon diversity measure of sizes of connected components uh, in the graph. And the way we do this is we don't only look at um, uh, one uh, level of protein failure, but we do this over all possible protein failure rates and then characterize this by the area under this curve, right? So for, at every protein failure rate, at every node deletion rate, we ask what is, the, what is the diversity of connected components we get, and then we look, take, look at the area under this curve. And what is, for example, uh, interesting is the, the lower the area, the more, the more robust network you have. So, for example, this is the, the Homo sapiens, the humans, right? And, you know, this is some, uh, um, and these are some other organisms that have lower resilience rates. And I'll just give you two findings. The first finding is that as the evolutionary time goes on, our protein networks get more resilient or more uh, robust over time. Um, and we can show that the robustness is good. So, for example, if you look at bacteria, then bacteria that can um, live in uh, more complex uh, environments has more resilient networks. Um, and what is also cool is that you can actually go deep into the networks and say, what is the mechanism by which networks get more robust? And the mechanism is that the number of, let's say, uh, nodes that have degree one is decreasing with evolutionary time, number of triangles is decreasing over time, but what is growing is the number of squares, where basically you have proteins that, that basically add these common proteins in between. They don't work with each other, but they have these common intermediaries, and the number of those is growing over time, right? So what's the thing? The thing is that this type of resilient network gives you a lot of evolutionary advantage, because it means that New, neutral mutations, mutations that in the current environment are not, uh, um, um, uh, are not distinctive, they, will, um, uh, they won't kill you because your network won't get disconnected, so you'll survive them, right? But in some sense, this reservoir of neutral mutations can become very, very, very favorable when the environment changes and these mutations that used to be neutral now all of a sudden become, uh, become advantageous, right? So, um, it's something very cool. There is paper on bioarchive, but I wanted to save it in two minutes. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, this is really work by my postdocs and my students. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? A couple of questions? Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, you. So, uh, in the first part of your talk, uh, you mentioned for the PIN uh, case study that uh, hard counterexamples were very important. It, when you presented the method, there was no counterexamples at, at, at which I couldn't uh, figure out. So what, how are these uh, examples used? Oh, you uh, use them at the training time. Right? Like at the training time, what you are basically doing is... Uh, I, I know things were a bit implicit, right? But what I want is I'm optimizing this objective function. I say the distance between the positive examples has to be smaller than between a positive and a negative example. This is the query, this is the positive guy, that's a negative guy. And now if I'm giving you this type of cases, I say put these two things closer than those two things. It's okay at the beginning where you are kind of figuring out how this should be at the large scale, but like I need to teach you kind of infinitely long for you to figure out that you know these two these two cakes are different than a than a zahar cake or you know some other type of cake or an apple pie, right? The apple pie will look some, somewhat similar, but somebody has to say and come to you and say, you know, it's hard for you to say. Will you be able to distinguish a cake from an apple pie by by looking at how cakes are different from sweaters? Probably not. So you eliminated the need for feature selection, but there's still uh, the hard problem of how to choose your training data. Correct? Exactly. And in these in this industrial cases, right, like in, in academia, uh, uh, usually you go, you download your data set, there is a good evaluation manager, and you, and you, and you, and you kind of beat that until it gives up, right? But uh, in, in industry, you have to create your data set. And usually you, you, you have positive examples, you know what's successful, recommendations were, but it's not here what unsuccessful recommendations were. So you somehow have to select them. And if you select them naively at random, it doesn't give you enough resolution 
to, to, to really train. So you have to be kind of smarter, how do you also select your negative examples. But the important thing is that you want to first start learning easy, so that you kind of figure out the, the large scale structure of this embedding space, and then start putting these guys in later when you worry about these fine, fine, fine grain distinctions. So this all happens at the training level. Yes? Um, really interesting talk. Given the computational demands of this approach about applying deep learning on graphs, the question is, do you think this could be applied to the current computational availability to online learning? For example, I'm thinking uh, brain networks and modeling uh, what happens in the, uh, EEG or functional MRI scans that happens kind of live online. Do you think it would be possible to do something like that? So, um, a few things, right? Uh, the the way we the way we the way you do this, you you have the training phase, and then you have the let's say the, the inference phase, and uh, the inference is relatively straightforward, right? So that's not computationally expensive. What's more computationally expensive is the tra is the training part, right? So now if you can allow yourself to I don't know, train offline, that 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 works well. The other thing is we are able to train about over, let's say, 1.3 billion examples, right, um, on, a, on a single machine in about a day. So I know if that's fast enough for you. Um, but, you know, it is something. Yeah, right. So one last question. Sarah, sorry. Um, Gender diversity. <laughs> I'm curious if you've uh, included anything with sort of like a, um, a hard positive example. So for here, these two thank you cards look very similar, but somebody else might be looking for like, or like the same person might want something that's more colorful or like a very different type of thank you card. So how would you not accidentally miss that? Great point. So, so I think that what the goal here is to really learn as well as possible what is similar. And, uh, um, uh, and then what you do is you have another ranking model on top of it that will then reorder, diversify, based on, let's say, what your guess is, what the user wants. Um, like, this, this is where it becomes very interesting, for example, in fashion, right? Like, in fashion, um, you just had this case when somebody would take a, 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 a picture of some dress with a model, and what happened then is that we would recommend related dresses, but the model was so matched. And then the people would, would, uh, would complain because they say, oh, you know, you're really matching on the model, you are not matching on the, on the dress. But really, you know, that's not, I think, the failure of this thing. The, the, the goal here is to learn things, you know, this very boring but very precise similarity. And then you need another kind of user model on top that then says, oh, this looks somebody's matching by color. Let's try to do that. So that's one idea. And then another idea that we are exploring is that, that is the following. Um, I go here, right? Right now I'm saying that there is one distance metric, but it's not like, right, I'm saying, let's find these embeddings and then let's measure these distances. But this distance metric can be such that it distorts the space based on, based on some external input, right? So the point is that when we learn these things, we can learn both the embedding, but you can also learn the distance metric or how to reason over this embedding, right? And, and you could imagine that we, could, we, can, we can learn things where I say, oh, color is very important. And this, you know, transforms this base embedding in kind of in different ways, right? So that I say, oh, color is important, subject is important, whatever. And I can learn how to kind of move across this embedding and measure distances in, in, a, in a specific way. Not that, you know, so the distance metric for fashion might be different than you know, it is perfect. That's a great point. Now, I know there are lots of other questions, but we have to stick to a schedule. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for coming.